You will now listen to my voice. My voice will help you and guide you still deeper into Europa. The Dane, Lars von Trier, shot a strange film, Epidemic, already in 1986. When shooting Epidemic, we experienced some very strong sensations in the field of hypnosis. We worked with real hypnosis, not only on a fictional level. A hypnotist came to hypnotize some of our actors. A very strong experience indeed, which confirmed my opinion as to the importance of the phenomenon. The hypnosis experts consider that the hypnotized subject is not completely possessed, as may be expected. His or her entire consent is required for the experience to be successful. And in a way, the hypnotized person only carries out his innermost desires. Lars von Trier generates a fascination which helps him to keep his collaborators in a state of dependence and assent. Without being directly comparable with the state of hypnosis, beneath his apparent kindness and heartiness, he controls each move of his following, who are totally devoted to him. This documentary, shot on the set of his latest film, Europa, was done under that kind of influence. Von Trier's first feature, The Element of Crime, was given the Advanced Technical Commission Award at the Cannes Film Festival in 1986. Since then, the Danish director's only objective has been to shoot the two following parts of the trilogy that started with The Element of Crime. Epidemic, the second part, which was also selected at the Cannes Festival in 1987, tells the story of how the first part was written. Europa, von Trier's third feature, is the continuation of the two others. To me, it seemed very important that the trilogy consist of films that weren't much alike. They should have something in common, but it shouldn't be immediately recognizable that it was a trilogy. What do they have in common, then? They tell almost the same story. It's the story of an idealist who travels into an area hoping to save the people, and it all goes wrong. Europa, which won an award in Cannes in 1991, 
follows the same pattern as the two preceding films, but this time through a classical thriller plot and in the setting of night trains. A children's book called The Train provided some of the images and inspired the script. A lot of pictures in this book are found in the film. The approach is a bit different since it's a very romantic children's book. But an interesting thing is that the book is about a dream, a dream of a train. The second idea behind the film is a technical postulate. Von Trier decided to shoot the scenery or background of the images independently of the foreground, and then mix the two different levels to obtain the final result. For instance, the exterior shot on location in Poland, and the actors shot in the studios in Denmark had to be superimposed of course, a script like this prevented any improvising on the set. Each shot had to be defined in advance with an extreme preciseness so that the images would be correctly superimposed in the laboratory or in the studio. The storyboard described each shot in detail, its length, frame, and the exact position of the actor in front of the background. It took two years and more than five different versions to obtain the final 800 drawings that were used during the shooting. Thus, split up into many levels, the scenes in Europa can sometimes consist of up to 15 different layers of images. And the technique, which demands that a scene be shot several times, allows surprising effects. The mixture of black and white and color, for instance. In order to connect the different levels, to make the scene seem only one, so that the audience won't notice the different layers, Von Trier has almost constantly created a bond between the foreground and background. In this scene, Barbara Sukova was first seen in black and white, filmed at an earlier occasion. She then appeared in front and in color to pursue her conversation with Jean-Marc Barr, who was really facing her this time, but let's watch the sequence once more. Barbara Sukova in black and white talks to Jean-Marc Barr in color, although they aren't together on the set. Their images are superimposed. Now the actors are really in front of one another and both are in color. The connection between the background and the foreground is a fact. Barbara Sukova's character having united the two different levels. But finally, Jean-Marc Barr leaves the foreground and reappears behind in black and white. You really get the impression that there's only one image and that the complete scene was shot at the same time. Of course, the combinations of foreground and background, of black and white and color, aren't just technical feats of prowess. The image in color is full with emotion. Here Jean-Marc Barr will pull the train's emergency brake. The first part of the shooting was done in Poland, where von Trier only looked for the exteriors. It was an unusual situation since this initial stage of the shooting took place in the absence of the actors. The crew was mainly Polish, and von Trier and his Danish assistant stayed in the only building which could provide accommodation in the small village of Chojnia, the priest's living quarters. Apparently, there's no lack of extras. But today, the news is bad. 
starszych i nie ma komu decydować. No. Two buses have just returned empty and the night shooting draws closer. It's Sunday and many of the Polish seem to have gotten lost on their way from church to the bar. The villagers will have to be replaced in the last minute by factory workers from the suburbs of the nearest big town, Stettin. Without the great supply of extras, tonight's impressing scene couldn't be shot. The buses finally provide the indispensable men and women who seem surprised to be there on the set. Today, the shooting takes place in a roundhouse, which will progressively be turned into a giant movie studio. All the scenes of Europa are shot at night. Edward Klosinski, director of photography in many of Andrzej Wadzia's films, runs the lighting in these Polish sequences. During the time-consuming preparatives, Lars von Trier has remained confined in his mobile home, probably looking through tonight's scenes. He doesn't show up until the last moment, when the set is ready, in order to rectify the ultimate details before shooting. Suddenly, all the problems are gone. The scene is shot easily in one single take, and Von Trier is already thinking of the next one. This scene requires a great deal more extras, and it must be perfectly organized. Since a railway car will be pulled out of a shed barehandedly and in reality. The women and children prepare. They stretch the rope to estimate the strength that will be required for this mass of several tons to be moved. Nobody is sure that it really can be done.
but they succeed. The genuine pre-war railway car is rolling again. later, the setting is the Choynia Cathedral, destroyed by the Russian army during the Second World War. <laughs> Paradoxically, the same army now assists the Polish production by lighting up the vast monument with the help of powerful anti-aircraft spotlights. In front of the cathedral, Lars von Trier is preparing one of this evening's scenes. He asks Edward Klosinski to stand in the foreground, close to the camera, at the exact spot where Jean-Marc Barr will be in the studio. An assistant replaces Barbara Sokova. Every conversation is held through an interpreter, as few of the Polish collaborators understand English or Danish. Some scenes will be shot inside the cathedral. The script says that Leo, the main character, should enter a church full of people at Christmas time, when big snowflakes are falling inside the roofless monument. Afterwards, Leo will get married in the same cathedral. Naturally, there isn't an inch of snow on the ground, and the weather will remain rather mild. Lars von Trier tells us that he has tried to recreate an atmosphere inspired by Alfred Hitchcock in an Andrei Tarkovsky setting. Finally, von Trier has imagined a shot from high up in the tower of the church during Leo's entrance. <laughs>
Because of the exactitude imposed by the storyboard and the script, Von Trier follows the scenes during the takes thanks to a video screen showing the images that are being filmed. It's now two o'clock in the morning and the shooting is interrupted. The extras refuse to continue and want to go home. Most of them will start working in a few hours and hadn't been informed of the late shooting schedule by the Polish producers. Furthermore, an extra in Poland earns only the equivalent to six dollars a day. You can easily understand why so many films are co-produced with Eastern Europe. Finally, the salaries are doubled and everyone gets back into their positions. In this scene, the extras watch Kate and Leo walk by. But since the actors are absent, a strange stand-in will replace the couple and indicate the exact direction of all gazes. A plastic cup. The rest of the shooting takes place in the Nordisk Film Studios in Denmark all through the summer of 1990. But this time the atmosphere has changed completely. Those who are missing are present at last. The actors. Barbara Sukova, who plays Kate, the leading lady. Yudo Kier, one of Von Trier's favorite actors. Jean-Marc Bau, who will soon give an interview. Eddie Constantine, who has worked with some of Europe's greatest directors. Thanks to the presence of the actors, the shooting suddenly becomes animated. <laughs> very animated indeed, as Von Trier and Jean-Marc Barr have got their own way of communicating. I beat my last director up, you better be careful. Thank 
<laughs> Judo Kier, who knows Von Trier well, describes his way of working with the actors. He chooses at the beginning of a film very interesting personalities by their looks, and then they just go through the film, and the technique tells the story, the technique uh, is uh, the actor principal. Why bother choosing actors who don't fit into their roles? You can do that, it's a different task, but it's easier to start from a point where the actor's character corresponds to the part he's playing. Then he can add something to the role rather than just fitting into a cliché. First day of shooting Medea, I tried to play, and then Lars said to me, what are you doing? I said, well, he said, no, no, just be very normal and feel it. He said, I put classical music on it, and if you act now, then it will be too much. So just underplay. I mean, Lars always goes down. And I, because I've worked already in two films with him, so I, I know in this film now, that I have to be very underplayed, which is very difficult, because of course you want always to act. That's my profession. We're standing here like it, waiting for you, and then you start, and then I start. You try it once more, yep. see if yeah. it's good. Can you hear me? For God's sakes, Kate! Did you even really understand your instructions? No. Mike, come on, do no, it. No. It's, more like, it's more like I want to look at him. He makes me do things I've never done as an actor before. I've always just been myself, and Fassbinder and Godard would tell me, fine, fine, excellent. But he says, no, no, not like that. A small part, that's just what I want. It's amusing, and I prefer to play the bad guy. Those are the best parts. 157, take three. Oh, action. <laughs> the superimposition of images essential to Europa will be done thanks to the technique of back and front projection, well known throughout film history. This way, the actors will be seen in front of the background shot in advance, generally, but not always, in Poland. In this particular scene, Jean-Marc Barr will get a phone call from Barbara Sukova through the screen. He will thus play his role without the actress being present on the set, simply in front of her image, filmed at another occasion. And, action. 147, take four. Hello? Hello, Leo. Kate. Is everything all right? Where are you? I'm in the villa in Frankfurt. What are you doing there? Can you come over here? I'll be in Frankfurt in half an hour. Are you okay? We'll talk when you get here. On the other hand, in this sequence, 
where the technique of superimposition of images also might have been used, von Trier preferred the reality of action. If you can speak about reality when the scenery is entirely false, with a railway car built in the studio. The idea of this make-believe train bouncing around on springs is as clever as it is simple and even allows two trains to pass one another. The final scenes under the water are partly shot in the reservoir of the Copenhagen Oceanographic Research Center, where von Trier uses sophisticated instruments. A camera is suspended above the water from a metal axis and controlled at a distance with great precision so that any camera movement is made possible. These scenes will remind Jean-Marc Barr of the shooting of the Big Blue, where he also practiced skin diving. Lars von Trier tries to find the gestures that will allow them to communicate in these conditions. What are we gonna make? Three shots. Okay. Under the surface, the scenes will be shot with the second camera and thanks to underwater spotlights. Without fear, von Trier even decides to dive himself in order to take a last look at the scenery under the water. Everything seems all right. Today's shooting may begin. Coming 
Okay, did you see the car either? We ready? Yeah, we're ready. Just smoke on the wheel. Alright, just give it back to the Thank you. John Mark has got a hard day's work before him, but the end of the Europa shooting is approaching. Let's not talk too much about the ending, but I can tell you this much. It's inspired by something Carl Dreyer once said. He asked the actors in Gertrude to move like suicidals through water. Suicidals who drown are said to take an upright position in the water. Follow the river. As days go by, head for the ocean. That mirrors the sky. You want to wake up to free yourself of the image of Europa, but it is not possible. 